Queen's Public Library continues to celebrate its 125th anniversary. Don't forget to browse our book list, share your QPL story, or take our library personality quiz. For more information, visit qpl125.org. For this year's celebration of Black History Month, Queen's Public Library is focusing on Black health and wellness from a holistic lens. Join our virtual programs, check out our Black History book recommendations, and get a copy of our health journal to track your progress throughout the month of February. Learn more at queenslib.org BHM 2022. Celebrate Lunar New Year, the Year of the Tiger, with our virtual programs and book recommendations. Learn more at queenslib.org LNY 2022. We are also celebrating Library Lovers Month with our annual photo contest. Participate today by going to queenslib.org slash librarylovers2022. Welcome to Queen's Public Library's talk with Edmund White, the author of A Previous Life. Andrew Sean Greer said of White's novel, elegant, erudite, raunchy, and fun. America's great man of letters is working at the top of his form, giving us a pair of portraits hung against the pattern of history. What a joy to read this master of prose and invention. Benjamin Moser has called it the best book in Edmund White's long and extraordinary career. I'm Brian Alessandro. For those of you who don't know me, I have written for Interview Magazine, Newsday, Pink, Huffington Post, and have recently adapted Mr. White's A Boy's Own Story into a graphic novel, co-adapted, which will be released this fall by Top Shelf Productions. Additionally, I recently co-edited an anthology of essays and interviews about William S. Burroughs, which will be published this summer. I am also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the literary journal, The New Engagement. Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski and now in its eighth year at the Queens Public Library, is proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award-winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. Now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. Edmund White is the author of 30 novels, memoirs, and biographies, including the 1982 classic, A Boy's Own Story, the definitive Jean Genet bio, Genet, and the new novel, The Previous Life. He is also the recipient of a National Book Award, a Penn Saul Bellow, and a New York Book Critics Circle Award. Ed, it's such an honor. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Well, thanks for having me. Of course. I have to say, I agree with Moser. I think this is your best book yet. Um, well, at least of the 10 of, that I've read. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. It's one third of your entire corpus. <laughs> um, it's it's really a, a kind of wildly experimental book. It feels very new. It's it's memoir, but also fiction or auto fiction or Romana Clef. It's an epistolary. Talk to us about what it is. Well, it, it is a, a strange book. I think it's a very controversial book. Hmm. I, I think it's gotten some of the best reviews of my life and some of the worst. Hmm. Uh, the, the worst ones in England, of course, where they they are really out to entertain people rather than inform them. And uh, so anyway, um, That's interesting. I don't know. The book is... Uh, I thought it would be interesting to create these two characters, uh, a husband and a wife. A husband is who's 30 years older than his wife. And uh, they uh, have already, even though the wife is o only 30, they've had um, very rich lives. They've 
she's been married twice before, and he's been married once before. But they, he's had many affairs with both men and women. Mm -hmm. She also is bisexual. And um, anyway, they, they, they're they stranded in a, in a uh, ski, uh, skiing house up in uh, Switzerland, mm -hmm. and he has a broken leg. And they've each written their memoirs. And they, uh, in addition of one, to just to be read by one other person and then destroyed. And so uh, they've never talked about their past lives before because they each felt that uh, it, I mean, in their previous marriages had been shipwrecked by their being too open. So uh, they've, they've decided to be more discreet. And But now they think that everything's going so well between them that they might as well be open. In fact, they're wrong. It does destroy their marriage. <laughs> but... Uh, Anyway, uh, uh, I mean, they, they both are pretty neurotic. <laughs> they are, yes. And uh, he's a, a Sicilian aristocrat and uh, who is... Ruggiero, a, right? He's Ruggiero. Ruggiero, Ruggiero. Ruggiero. And he, uh, I spell Ruggiero in a weird way, but the way that the king of Sicily did. Hmm. And... Uh, I mean, usually there's an I in there, R-U-G-G-I, but I, I left the I out. It's just E-R-O because that's the way the King of Sicily wrote it. Anyway, um, he, um, uh, he he's a, a Baroque musician and plays the harpsichord and uh, has, is independently wealthy. And uh, <laughs> my next book, I'm going to write about a poor girl because I'm so tired of writing about rich people who might know that well. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, so, but, um, and she is, uh, uh, she has a, a, a black American father and a white American mother, and they both die in a car crash when she's very young. Mm -hmm. And she's raised by the family maid who is from, uh, Mauritius, Il Maurice, whatever you call it, mm -hmm. and uh, in the Indian Ocean, and 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 then her brother, the 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 maid's brother, ab starts to abuse Constance, who's my heroine, mm -hmm. and uh, that's her initiation into sex. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, believe it or not, the whole book was read by a sensitivity editor. Who uh, who made a a big point about those? Um, um, she didn't object to those scenes of of uh, child abuse, but wanted me to elaborate them, and uh, and so I did. But, That's interesting and surprising. Have you ever been read by a sensitivity editor before? Yeah, yes, they do that now. Uh, I mean, uh, Saint from Texas was read by a sensitivity editor too. And, but she had very few things to say. I like that the the notes, the guidance was to elaborate, though, rather than to reduce or to, to censor. Yes. Well, I think this woman was uh, an expert of uh, about pedophilia, uh, heterosexual pedophilia. And so she wanted uh, me to go into steps about grooming and all this stuff. Wow. And... and uh, I have a number of friends who were abused as children, and uh, so I knew lots of details about that. And I mean, like one of the things is that the children have been pledged to never say anything about it. So in school, they tend to become catatonic, and they don't talk about anything, much less about their sex life. And, uh, you know, and they oftentimes have trouble in school because they're all the time they're saying this mantra to themselves. I mustn't tell. I mustn't tell. I mustn't tell. Anyway, it's a very interesting subject and it's very widespread, of course. And it becomes a distraction for them, that kind of fixation on, on keeping it contained. Exactly. You feature yourself prominently in the book, too. There's a character named Edmund White. Can you talk to us about that decision? 
Well, I've written a million times about myself. Uh, I've written, I think, five memoirs. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, and that's pretty uh, um, overwhelming. But I, uh, I thought it would be fun to write about myself in the third person. Uh, in other words, from the outside and looking in and uh, as a kind of caricature uh, of, of me. And uh, I think I'm unusually harsh with myself, but, uh, but I... Um, yes, you are. <laughs> but I, I think it, that was partly because I don't, didn't want anybody to say, oh, he let himself off lightly. Mm. And he was hard on everybody else. But, but because I, I wanted the thing to be scrupulously honest. Was it easier to do because you were able to take that objective step back in writing fiction and creating a character of yourself? It gave you license to be a little bit more to scrutinize or, or to be more critical of yourself. Well, you know, when you write in the first person, uh, you... I don't, I, at least I don't usually talk about my own writing or my own inner feelings that much. I talk about the people I've known and the worlds I've passed through. But uh, like the New York in the 60s and 70s, Paris in the 80s and so on. Right. But uh, in, in, the, in this portrait, I was able to talk more about... Uh, Edmund White's thoughts and feelings and so on. The, the, oddly enough, when you surrender to the third person, you can oftentimes be more intimate than in the first person. I find that too, interestingly. The book takes place primarily in the future, right? The year 2050? Well, I only did that because I wanted, I didn't want to write a science fiction book with lots of new gadgets and everything, but I wanted to, or new political realities, but I wanted to uh, uh, stage it long after my death <laughs> because they, because uh, everybody talks about me in the book as a minor writer that almost <laughs> is entirely forgotten. <laughs> and, uh, I know. Which I, is yeah. ludicrous, by the way. What? Oh, well, <laughs> Which is ludicrous, by the way. It, no, it probably isn't. I mean, you know, Nabokov. Well, I also talk about feminism and gay liberation and all these things as being tiresome right, old right. concerns of the past that are now completely dated and nobody wants to hear about them. Hmm. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, it, you know, it, uh, it's a difficult book. I mean, it's certainly controversial. I said to Michael after I got all these terrible reviews in England, the worst of my life, I said, uh, is this a bad book? That's my, my husband. And he said, no, but it's very controversial. And I think that's true. Yeah, I read some of the, the negative English reviews and I was just flabbergasted. I, I, I was surprised that they found any flaws. I, I myself gave you a rave review in Newsday because I loved it so much. I know. Um, I... Of course, it was, it was very easy to do um, when, the, when the book is that great. I think you explore sexual fluidity and bisexuality with a lot of care and complexity. Um, how have you gained such thoughtful access? Well, I, um, I mean, unlike many gay men in New York, I, I have a lot of women friends, <laughs> mm -hmm. and and uh, and in France, we never had a dinner party where there weren't women. I mean, the, this thing of all men getting together still seems to me very strange, mm -hmm. but. Um, Anyway, I and people confide in me. I think because I am a writer, mm -hmm. people will tell me their stories, and um, uh, I think uh, Michael's walking away because he hates for me to talk about. Yeah. I like women. <laughs> but you, I should also say, you also write with depth and authority about not just sex and relationships, but also history, art, culture, and Europe. What has allowed you to have such a command on these topics? Well, I lived in Paris for 16 years, mm -hmm. and I was a journalist for many years. And journalists know a little bit about everything, but not much about anything. <laughs> and uh, I, I was always, when I, I first started working for Time Life Books, 
and we would have uh, luncheons at the top of the Time Life building with the editors who had all been in World War II and we had crew cuts and were he men. And, uh, and they knew everything about everything. I mean, I was so amazed because I'd gone, I'd gone to the University of Michigan, which was considered an okay school, uh, but I didn't, I never met an adult who knew more than I did, uh, even as a teenager. But these adults knew everything about art, about music, about, well, New Yorkers, a lot of New Yorkers are like that. Very learned, yeah. But you also were a doctoral candidate um, at one point at Harvard as well, no, where you were accepted. I was into accepted, a but I never went. I was accepted to Harvard twice as an undergraduate and as a graduate student. But but uh, the first time, my shrink, who was in Detroit, didn't want me to leave. He said I would go crazy if I did, mm -hmm. and uh, and he went crazy and oh. had to be confined in the mental hospital. Jeez. But uh, anyway, uh, and my the second time I was accepted. At Harvard, I, I fell in love with a classmate of mine from the University of Michigan, and I decided to move to New York instead of going to Harvard, because that's where he was trying to be an actor. How? Let's shift back for a moment to a previous life. How did the, the, the concept, the plot, occur to you? Oh, very, very incrementally. I don't really... I, I mean, you know, uh, Ian Forster says that writers should... I have an idea where they're going, like the horizon, but that uh, in walking toward the horizon, they're not aware of every landmark along the way until they get into the writing. And um, and I think I, uh, I don't know, I, uh, I, 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 I guess I, well, I had had a very unhappy love affair with somebody much like Ruggiero. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I mean, he was an astonishingly handsome and interesting and brilliant person, but uh, he wasn't in, into old men like me. And, but but he, he was in love with me for three years. Mm -hmm. And then quite rightly, <laughs> he left me for somebody his own age. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, he was half my age. And so, and that was really, really, really painful. I think the most painful experience of my life. So I don't think the book was exactly psychotherapy, but it it was a chance to uh, come to terms with all this. Was it, given that, was it emotionally difficult to write? More difficult than on any other book or novel? Uh, I don't, I'm trying to be very honest about that. I don't think so. I think, um, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but I think writing, I'm in, I'm in psychoanalysis right now as a patient, and I think that's a very different experience from writing about the same experiences. Because when you're writing about something, you're constantly trying to make it interesting. Mm -hmm. You're always rebooting it and uh, introducing new characters, new complexities, and trying to find balance between events that happen early and the ones that happen late and so on. And, uh, and, and uh, my husband, Michael, is always trying to get me to put more action and more dialogue and things because I, I tend to be very analytic and descriptive mm. and, and, and that bores the hell out of everybody. So I, I'm, I'm trying to follow his lead and, um, but I don't know. Uh, so you're, so you're really, when you're writing about an experience, you're always following, the, you're worrying about those technical matters of suspense, development of characters, uh, ratio of dialogue to description, so on. And um, I mean, those are all the things we tried to teach in creative writing class. And, um, and I taught creative writing at Princeton for 20 years. Right, that's right. Uh, but... Um, when you're when you're in psychoanalysis, the, at least my therapist, who I think is wonderful, uh, will get me to uh, instead of blabbing and just rattling off emotional things the way I am doing now, right now, uh, he'll say, "Now stay with that for a minute," you know, 
wait for a whole minute and feel try to feel that and then see what you think of it and you know so i think that's been very good for me i've i've uh kind of taken repossession of myself i think that there's a there's a a pretty happy relationship between psychotherapy or psychoanalysis and creative endeavors and certainly writing um you work very quickly and you're quite prolific what is your process is it something you're able to articulate uh, you know I, I always read these paris review interviews of famous writers and they talk about working eight hours a day I, if i work eight minutes a day it's a lot <laughs> uh, I, mean, I, I really don't uh i mean but but i do i do a lot of what what flaubert called the marinade where you lie on your couch and you try to think up the next episode of your book and and i find myself going around mumbling to myself uh phrases that interest me and 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 you know i'm always i i mean one of the nice things about writing a book is like a, a a bad, a bad love affair. Uh, writing, <laughs> writing a book is like a bad love affair because you're always rehearsing it in your mind, mm. and, and it ties all your days together. Mm. Yeah, yeah. cheating yeah. on me. Uh, what am I going to say in the next chapter? <laughs> uh, That's great. Um, what's happening in contemporary literature right now that you like most? Not necessarily a particular book, but maybe a trend or. Well, um, it's funny. I read so much, or you'd think I'd have a quick answer to it. But uh, uh, it doesn't seem to me to be a very unified thing. I mean, there is a lot of uh, of auto fiction, but I think people are trying to explore new ways of writing about themselves. And uh, so, like, though you know, the there'll be a, a, a well, I don't know. I, I, mean, I have a, a book club of two people with Yi Yun Li every day, the Chinese American writer, yeah, cool. and uh, and so we're constantly reading books, but mostly silly ones because we love to giggle. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, they tend to be old books, but books of the '30s and '40s. But. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, I mean, what have I liked recently so much? Books. <laughs> well, you mentioned Yi Yang Lee. Of course, we should tell everyone that you're good friends with her and that she ended up taking the, the chair of the English department um, position well, at Princeton. What chair? I, I, it was just my, my uh, well, it, it was not a chair. It's just my post uh, when I quit. Uh, I recommended her, uh, and uh, and th they they loved her from the very beginning, and uh, she is very prolific too. Yes, she is. You co-founded um, the Gay Men's Health Crisis with Larry Kramer in 1982. What was that experience like? How do you feel now, looking back on that enormous accomplishment? Well, at the time, it didn't seem enormous. I mean, one of the interesting things is that when I, I moved to France in '83, and so uh, I, I only had a. I, I was the first president of the Gay Men's Health Crisis. That's right. I doubt if anybody remembers that, but anyway, I was, and uh, and uh, I found it. I didn't like what it did in my personality because. I, it made me very authoritarian. I was like, saying, shut up, we're going to vote now, and that kind of thing. And you have to be very patient with other people. And I'm not particularly patient, and certainly <laughs> not diplomatic. But, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, but then when I moved to France, I, I got involved with the, their first AIDS group called Ed, A-I-D-E-S. And uh, I was impressed by whereas we American gays were so oppressed mm -hmm. uh, that the only thing we could think of as a fundraiser was to give a disco party. <laughs> you know, it's so yeah. pathetic. Yeah. Whereas, whereas the Ed, which was founded in 1985, um, went directly to the Minister of Health in France 
and and got a huge budget from her. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the way to do it. Sure. You know, we we were like little disco queens. And, <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to that point, what are your thoughts about contemporary gay culture? Oh, cont uh, I, I don't even think about it very much. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, does it have, it's well, it seems like it, it's it's very it's been very heterosexualized. I mean, mm -hmm. you would know because you're married and you live in the suburbs. Sure. And um, <laughs> how dare you, Ed? Yeah, but well, when are you going to adopt your child? Oh my God! Well, we have cats instead. We have we have we don't have cats. Where did that come from? We have a dog and lizards and tortoises and a saltwater aquarium and birds. Now we have birds. So that's that's what, that's our version of children. I'm I'm sure you'll have actual children before yeah. long. I don't know about that. Anderson Cooper just got a new one. I saw. I just saw. <laughs> so you've written five memoirs, and most of your fiction, including this recent book, features characters based on people in your life. Um, how have friends reacted to your portrayals of them? I know that Susan Sontag was upset initially by her portrayal in uh, Car Caracol. Yeah. 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 Uh... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, but mostly people haven't been. I mean, I, I disguise, disguise them pretty well. Um, but you never know. You, uh, you know, so my mother, I, I wrote a lot about my mother, mm -hmm. and she was a really good sport. She never complained. And even though I would say kind of awful things about her sometimes. And, and she'd say to my sister, well, I got off more lightly than you did. Oh, boy. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But of course, they lived in suburban Chicago where nobody would have ever heard of one of my books, hmm. and much less my Texas relatives who are all Baptists. They would never, they don't even know I'm a writer. What? No. I mean, why would they? Because they only read Christian books. Wow. Interesting. Do you ever worry about yeah, bookstores? Would never hold, would never. They go to Baptist bookstores, and that would never handle one of my books. That's a good point. That's fair. Um, do you ever worry about how people might react um, when you write about them or create characters based on them? Is that ever a preoccupation? Um, I'm trying to think. I, you know, I, I, I was madly in love with somebody. Called Jim Ruddy in the in the uh, '60s, and uh, and I I wrote about him quite a bit in the beautiful room is empty, mm -hmm. and uh, and then it, he died of AIDS, and and in the '80s, his lover of the time, Ivan, called me and said uh, Jim really liked your portrait of him. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, you know, who knows? I mean, sure. but, but I think people pe people don't don't read. So if you want to bury a secret, publish it. <laughs> That's hilarious and tragic at the same time. You lived in Paris, you said, from 83 to, was it 2008? Was that the span? What time was it, Michael? When did we come back? We came back. 98. 98. 98. Okay, sorry about that. How did France and the French culture influence you as a thinker and a writer? You were so incredibly immersed for so many years. Well, uh, I uh, I read an awful lot of French books while I was there. I was working for Vogue, and I was supposed to be a cultural reporter mm -hmm. and for American Vogue. And so I would try to write about the interesting new writers, the interesting new plays and operas and things. But the trouble with Americans is they really only want to hear about Americans in Paris. Mm. They don't want to hear about French people in France. That's and, true. I mean, look at the success of, what's that show? Emily in Paris on, on Netflix. Everybody's talking about it. It's about an American girl from Chicago who lives in Paris. <laughs> yeah, the there you go. I mean, you know, like I thought uh, there were so many interesting things that 
were happening in Paris, not just highbrow things, but for instance, there was a play in the 80s where uh, Marie Antoinette was on trial every night and the audience had to decide whether to behead her or not. They usually decided to behead her. <laughs> <laughs> They're so predictable. <laughs> That's but, you know, but uh, I, I wanted to write about that because I thought that was amusing, but no, mm -hmm. no Americans. No. What book of yours do you take the most pride in? I think Hotel de Dream, which is, a, a, a short book, uh, and it's about Stephen Crane, Crane yeah. and the guy who wrote Red Badge of Courage. Mm -hmm. And in in re, in real life, he had written a book about a female prostitute uh, called Maggie Girl of the Streets, and then he met a boy prostitute, and he he became not sexually, but just uh, sociologically interested in him and he w was a he himself was the son of a presbyterian minister and so he tended to have great sympathy for prostitutes mm -hmm. and for the whole kind of living on the wild side and um anyway and he got in trouble with the new york police because he was always defending prostitutes uh whom they would uh, arrest for no good reason and uh, anyway uh, so he decided to write a book about uh, this boy prostitute, but uh, but then um, one of his best friends, Hamlin Garland, who was a Midwestern writer from from uh, um, from Wisconsin, a kind of hairy chested, totally straight guy, said, "Oh my God, if you you can't write this book, it'll ruin your career." Hmm. And so he find. Hamlin Garland finally convinced him to stop writing it. But but I kept thinking, if that had been published in 1890, it would have really changed the course of American literature or culture or whatever. Anyway, but it probably never would have been published anyway. Hmm. But, uh, but I decided to write it for him. And so uh, I did a, a tremendous amount of research into the gay life of that of the 19th century, late 19th century in New York, and even the way people talked, and there, the first gay bar was on Bleecker Street, and uh, it was called the Slide, which is the name of a later bar in New York, I think on the Bowery, but that that had nothing to do with this. It was independent of that, but the first bar, the Slide, was it had a balcony where the, all these uh, men in drag sat around at tables and then gentlemen would come up the stairs and, and, and sit with them and then try to engage them for their favors. And um, I mean, it was definitely a kind of parody of heterosexual life. At, yeah, yeah, for sure. At that point. And, uh, and I, I, it's, it, in later years, it was a thing called Kenny's Hideaway. And I once went to it uh, just to check it out. And the owner of the place I started chatting with, who was standing out front smoking a cigarette, and he said to me that down below there were all these little rooms that the prostitutes would take their customers to. And, and the, the basement was honeycombed with these little chambre d'assignation and uh, rooms for assignations. Uh -huh. And um, so anyway, I, I had gone to that bar like a homing pigeon in the 60s when I first arrived in New York. At that time, it's called the Bleecker Street Tavern. And the balcony was still there, but it had been condemned because it was so rickety. And there was this nice old lesbian bartender who we all liked. And that's the first time I ever heard... Um, Oh, who's the star of, of Funny Girl? Barbara Streisand. Barbara Streisand. The first time I ever heard Barbara Streisand's voice was was there. I mean, she was singing uh, "Happy Days Are Here Again," oh, yeah. which was her first big hit. And then she was playing just down the street on Eighth Street, and and I would go there to see her too. Hotel to Dream is is a really uh, terrific book. 
it's it's uh, kind of wondrous and, and imaginative and, and really rigorously researched. Do you have any, cre I can't imagine you do, but I'm gonna ask the question anyway. Do you have any creative or literary uh, choices that you might have regretted? Oh, sure. <laughs> oh. I mean, but I think, uh, I mean, the two books that have been really the most violently criticized is, is this one uh, that I've just written and uh, uh, previous life and uh, and also uh, Caracol, mm -hmm. the one that you mentioned that Susan Sontag took exception to. Mm -hmm. And I think that was like gay bookstores hated it because there were no gay characters. Mm -hmm. And so they refused to handle it. And, uh, and I think straight bookstores didn't even know who I was in those days. And, uh, I mean, I had a niche market, but I was ignoring my niche market mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, with that book. And uh, then I went back and wrote uh, The Beautiful Room is Empty. It was my next book. So I got back on the gay bandwagon. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> And also an incredible book. Oh, thank you. In addition to Rimbaud and Proust, you also wrote an immense biography about Genet, which is my favorite book of yours, non-fiction. Non, uh, um, how long did it take you to research it? It's, it's a, it's a seven, quite- Seven years. Seven years. And, and, I, and it, I hadn't written a word after like five years. And the publisher who had given me a, a nice advance said, well, where is it, or where are you in the book? Oh, I'm halfway through, I said. I hadn't written one word. Oh, and uh, and uh, I thought, it, I was visiting New York briefly, and I was I thought, if I step in front of this bus, I'll never have to pay back my advance. <laughs> That's so grim. It's, and I'm glad you didn't, and I'm glad that you wrote it, because it's one of my favorite biographies ever written about anybody. Oh well, thank you, thank you. Well, it was I. I had enormous assistance from uh, Albert Dishi, who was uh, my researcher on the book, and who. But I, I, one of the good things that happened is that uh, is is that Gregory Rowe, who was uh, uh, working part time for me as a researcher, was a very cute American. Uh, he discovered one day a little funny newspaper published in Paris called the Morvan Dio, and it was uh, for the people who had lived in the Morvan, which was sort of the Kentucky of, of France. And, and uh, I, I mean, it's very remote and hilly. And uh, so anyway, he d discovered this little newspaper, and in it was my, my classmate, Jean Genet, written by Monsieur Brule. Uh, and uh, and so nobody had ever known where Genet lived, or, uh, what village he lived in, or where he'd grown up, and nothing about his past, because he would never tell anybody, including Sartre, who wrote that huge fat book called Saint Genet, but yeah, yeah. Uh, the biographical information it could be reduced to 30 pages. I mean, it's mostly a, a meditation on a psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. a, a way of proving uh, Sartre's own theories of existentialism. <laughs> I hear Michael cackling in the background. He's such a great audience. <laughs> yeah. You won the New York Book Critics Circle Award for that, <laughs> that book for the Virgin A. Yes. Yeah. I, I think I, I wasn't able to collect it because I was living in France, but uh, but I, uh, I, I, I th I, th I understand that I was given it mainly because of its research. Mm. Uh, that uh, I mean, it's true that Genet was one of the hardest uh, writers to ever write about because most writers are middle class, mm -hmm. and their mothers dote on them, and they show early talent, <laughs> and their mothers collect all their uh, uh, juvenilia, and then they have tons of literary friends. <laughs> who all write letters to them and they write back and and all that stuff is and then they're always sounding off in in, in editorials <laughs> about their views on this and that Genet was not like that at all he was a uh, he was um a foundling and he was uh, not adopted but 
put out as a orphan, but a, not an orphan, but a foster a foster child mm -hmm. uh, at, with a family in the Morvan. And the Morvan w w was famous from Roman times for raising cattle and children mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> because uh, like, uh, uh, like if, if you were a rich lady in Paris and you had a baby, you wouldn't want to nurse it yourself, but you would get uh, some lady from the Morvan who just had a baby uh, to come mm -hmm. to Paris and nurse it and forget about her own child. Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, that so that was a real uh, practice there, but uh, anyway, he was raised in the Morval, and by chance, his his mother, his uh, foster mother and father, lived right next to the school, and so most of the kids uh, had to do farm work and rarely got to school, and they lived miles away, but he had no excuse and. So he would go to school every day, and he was the smartest child in the whole county. And uh, I mean, he he was really brilliant. Yeah, and in addition to being brilliant, I think because of that childhood, he really had no sort of patience for pretenses, and and you know came with a lot of grit and sort of radical is radical ideas, and uh, and so it makes his his his. Uh, his literature is so authentic, I think, and confrontational. Um, and original. Uh, original, wildly original. Yeah. Amazingly original. I mean, the, uh, the, the, you know, Our Lady of the Flowers, his first novel was um, the first portrait of a drag queen uh, in, in history that I know of. Yeah. And the first um, uh, kind of shameless book about, about, gay sex including anal sex looks like sh trigger warning well, and that's, that's, that's fine this is an adult program so but uh and and more radical and graphic uh forms of of violent sex as well and you know I, sure. I scenes with his landlord and, and um i want to shift gears one moment in 2018 you won the pen soul bellow and in 2020 you were awarded the national book award which was presented to you by john waters um, how does it feel to receive so many major accolades and recognitions at this stage in your career, just within the last few years? Well, uh, better late than never. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think, and uh, but you know, I think most writers think there's it's never enough. Mm -hmm. They always want more, and I'm probably one of those too. Greedy, greedy pusses as we are. Places. Um, I want to tell our, our viewers that we're going to start taking questions for Edmund shortly, so please start sending them in. Ed, you mentioned earlier that you had taught for 20 years at Princeton and retired in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. Do you, do you miss teaching? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, uh, you know, like... Uh, uh, I poor Yi Yun's always telling me about faculty meetings, and I think, oh my god, <laughs> poor girl. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, sitting around listening to all those people. And... So much of teaching, especially at the university level, I think, is is sort of bogged down by a lot of administrative work and and, and meetings and. Yeah, I was head of the creative writing uh, program for a while, and I. And being authoritarian, I said to all the other teachers, uh, I'll just make all the decisions, okay? Let's not have any meetings. And so we had no meetings, and everybody loved that because they were all writers who'd rather write and mm -hmm. pursue their own uh, hobbies than to, uh, than to uh, sit around listening to a few windbags. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Did you actually enjoy, though, the time that you had with the students in the classroom, though? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I had some one, you know, at Princeton, you have some pretty brilliant students mm -hmm. and uh, not very many gay ones. But because I was open about being gay, they were open about all about their incest and their abortions and everything. Wow. I heard a lot. What are you working on right now? You just finished another novel. 
Yeah, I just finished a novel called The Humble Lover, and uh, it's uh, about an older man who uh, falls in love with a, a 20-year-old French-Canadian ballet dancer and who... Uh, uh, and the, the boy isn't attracted to him at all, but says that he can't sleep alone. He has a, a real um, hang-up about that. So the older man says, well, you can sleep with me every day, and I won't touch you. Hmm. And, and I think that's pretty realistic. I think that a lot of people, if you're really in love, you, you you just want to be with the other person and you don't want him to have sex with anybody else. Mm. <laughs> but he doesn't have to have sex with you. Right. It's a compelling story. Did you, what kind of research did you do for this one? Oh, oh well, uh, 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 quite a bit about dance. And I, I, Michael will tell you, I've sat, I've sat around for hours and days looking at, classes and dance and reading books about dance. Mm -hmm. You know, dancers, ballet dancers have written quite a few memoirs. Mm -hmm. And uh, and my character was in the New York City Ballet. And, and I, I, I'm very happy to say that... Uh, uh, Who's the composer of the... Composer of what? That likes my writing. Nico Muli? Nico Muli, uh, who's a composer and who uh, has written ballet scores and so on, and who's a friend, friendly with all those people like Justin Peck. Um, mm -hmm. I, he was the first person to read this book, I, and, uh, and he liked it a lot. And That's great. Uh, so uh, I, I, and he felt it was. And then my agent had an affair with a ballet dancer, and he said my book brought back a lot of memories for him, not all pleasant. Oh, wow. Well, those are two really great validating um, <laughs> seals of approval, I think. Um, we have a question from one of our viewers. Can you talk a little about being an eyewitness of the Stonewall Rebellion? Yes, it was really by chance that uh, I was walking with a, a friend of mine, Charles Birch, uh, uh, down Christopher Street, and we just happened to be going past uh, the Stonewall. When when the uprising began, and Charles was a kind of a feisty guy who liked confrontation. I was, uh, I am <laughs> much more middle class and uptight. So mm -hmm. I, my first instinct was to say, "Oh, come on, guys, relax, You're cool it, don't do it," you know. But anyway, he he got right into the fray, and. Uh, and it was a uh, that that was a bar that uh, where there were a lot of uh, black clients and Puerto Rican clients who we called A trainers because they'd come down from uh, Harlem on the A train, and and this was on the in the village, uh, which was still pretty much a white bastion at that point, mm -hmm. but this particular bar was. It wasn't a discotheque. I mean, people say that, but it, it had a jukebox mm -hmm. and uh, was with very up to date music on it. It was a mafia joint, mm -hmm. and there was a big mafia guys mm -hmm. on a stool uh, sitting at the door, and with a, a dead cigar in his mouth, and uh, and it was very unhygienic. I mean, they had no running water, and so they 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 would just dip the glasses into a a a a, a, a vase of dirty water, and uh, you know it was really horrible. But uh, anyway, it was exciting because it was because gay places had all been closed by Mayor Daly mm -hmm. uh, for the World's Fair, and uh, because he tried to clean up the city. Uh, and uh, and so he closed all the gay bars in, and I think only Julius's stayed open, and it had very strict rules that you had to uh, uh, look out the window with your back to the bar, and you couldn't be near anybody, and oh, I had lots, of, and the lights had to be very bright and so on. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, 
but uh, there were no other gay bars aside from Julius's, and but but then this one, it seemed like things were relaxing. There was a a new mayor whom everybody liked and who was handsome, and uh, and the, the uh, and it seemed like the police were had been going to sensitivity courses or something. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, it seemed like everything was going to be better. But mm -hmm. then suddenly they raided the stone wall and hauled people off in uh, Black Mariah's. And after they hauled the first group off, mostly of employees, not really customers, then uh, customers began to fight back. And, and they knew that some cops were still inside the bar with the rest of the people they'd arrested. And so they, they, they pulled up the, um, the, the meter, the parking meters and used them to ram the door open. And, and, and people started uh, laughing because it was really the first funny revolution. <laughs> because, because people would say gay is good or we're the Pink Panthers, and 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 and, and gay is good. It was kind of trying to riff on Black is Beautiful, which, but I mean, it was a very turbulent time in American history because there had been uh, there were the Vietnam protests going on, there were um, uh, Black Panthers, so the there, movement, yeah, and uh, the, there was the feminist revolution, and before that, the sexual revolution. And all all that '60s stuff was uh, very much in the air. This came at the end of the '60s, and uh, I can remember some heterosexual leftists trying to organize us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, because that, revolution. That's funny. <laughs> but it was a funny revolution, and uh, and and we would do things like, you know, that. Uh, the, we knew the topography of the village streets much better than the cops did. Mm -hmm. So the cops would come in a flying wedge down Christopher Street, and we would come up behind them on Gay Street mm -hmm. and, and, and in a chorus line, all kicking and screaming. That's great. That's great. And, you know, it was funny. Speaking of turbulent times, another question just came in. Can you speak a little on the rash of book bans in the USA. Of course, Mao's, right, by Art Spiegelman has sort of started that off two weeks ago. Yes, well, uh, I mean, you know, there are a lot of uh, book bans of, of, of especially children's and young adult books for gays in places like Fayetteville, how do you say it? Fayetteville? Fayetteville. And uh, is that Arkansas? Arkansas, uh, Arkansas, and uh, you know, uh, Ville Lafayette, Arkansas, <laughs> and Tennessee, right? Yeah, Tennessee, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. But but you know, General Lafayette uh, was a great hero in America, and when he came back in 1830, after or or I think yeah, about 1830, uh, he was welcomed. They the American Congress, which was so cheap, actually gave him a million dollars and a big chunk of Manhattan. They that family still owns a big part of Midtown. Interesting. <laughs> anyway, and yet, uh, and yet this is the location of some of the the country's most noted book bans and book burnings and. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And uh, I think the idea is that um, is that gay life is so attractive that. Uh, if children are exposed to it, they'll immediately convert, <laughs> which I don't think is true. I mean, like, uh, I think most gay people or many gay people will tell you that their first gay experience was with the village idiot or, or some other pervert, and and that they they that it they weren't converted because their teachers or their coaches were so charming and beautiful, but be, but. It was just a, an impulse within them. It, certainly, that was my case. Interesting. We have one. We have one, we have time for one final question, um, Ed. 
this comes from one of our uh, viewers, 40 years or so into the AIDS epidemic and two years into the COVID pandemic, do you think you have a handle on how all this might shape how one both writes about and even thinks about desire? That's an interesting question. That's a really good question. Um, I, do you notice how uh, people always say that's a good question when they don't know how to answer it? No, I, I think, uh, well, I mean, a lot of people have written about AIDS, but I think sometimes it takes 10 years, maybe, or eight to 10 years after an event for people to absorb it and to be able to talk about it. Like Rebecca Mackay wrote a wonderful novel not so long ago uh, about uh, AIDS. I don't remember. The Great Believers, right? Say it again. The Great, the great, the great Believers, yeah. yeah. And, you know, but that... She's a young woman who, who wasn't, I don't think, even born at the time. And uh, and her her book is, uh, I think there, that, you know, it's like the great Civil War novels were written. I mean, like uh, even uh, Stephen Crane, who wrote Red Badge of Courage, he wasn't even born yet when the when the war ended. Right. And, uh, and he only read about, what inspired him was reading uh, 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 accounts of it by old soldiers who'd been in the war in magazines. Mm. And they would tell their stories and that inspired him. And, uh, but, but, you know, I think people usually, uh, it, there's a time lag between the event and the fictional account of it. Some distance from it, fair. Ed, thank you so much for this evening and for this discussion and thank you all for watching. Have a good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brian.